Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, I want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on behalf of myself, Alice, and Mark. We're continuing on in our study of Paul's letter, second letter, to Timothy. Mm -hmm. And this is our seventh week in, in this particular letter, zipping right along. Two verses at a time. Well, that's okay. That's because there's a lot of, a lot a lot of, of meat in the word there. Yes. So we're going to pick that up. Um, we're in the first chapter, still in the first chapter, and we'll be starting with the 15th verse. 2 Timothy 1.15 is where we will start right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together. Well, Lord, because we are believers, we know you are with us to guide us in what we say and do here, and we just invite you to do so. And just pull out from your word what we need to see, hear, and understand. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, if you, and by the way, let me remind you again, it's always a good thing in this kind of Bible study if you have some way to take notes so you can jot, if something strikes your fancy, you want to look something up later, you can jot it down, make a, make a note. Uh, you may have a question, something that, that, that's said here, and we also always welcome you. You can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions or comments or suggestions you might have. God's watching. <laughs> And not from a distance. Not from a distance, not at all. He is a God who is not far off. All right. All right, 2 Timothy 1.15. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Uh, again, I suggest in Bible studies, I strongly suggest actually that you use one of the more literal translations, like the King James, New King James, New American Standard, the English Standard Version. Uh, we're living in a day and age that Jeremiah, and God spoke to Jeremiah to warn about. Beware the lying pen of the scribes. There's a lot of lot of translations out there that are lying pen, the work of the lying pen of the scribes. But I'm not going to get into that right now. 2 Timothy 1.15 You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Figulus and Hermogenes. Now this is Paul writing, okay? And he's telling Timothy, these people, all the people in Asia. Now, Paul had an incredible, when he's talking about Asia, he's particularly talking about what is modern day Turkey, mm -hmm. where so many of the churches are. So much of the church uh, was out. Because remember, now after 70 AD, when Rome had dis basically destroyed Jerusalem mm -hmm. and kicked the Jews out, okay, the basic places, the most important places, were, and not Rome, by the way, were uh, Alexandria in the north of Africa and Antioch in, in, in Turkey. What, what is Turkey now? So when he says in Asia, but Paul had such an influence in that area. I mean, and the church, specifically the church at Ephesus, which, by the way, Timothy wound up being the, the overseer of. The word went out like just like a fire. For like a wildfire from Ephesus and spread throughout that area. But now Paul is saying everybody there in Asia has turned away from him. He is it's almost, and I say this judiciously, he's almost like the father of the church in Asia. Yeah. And they've turned their back on him. And they've turned their back. You know, and later on in this letter, in, in the fourth chapter, Paul says, at my first defense, now remember, he's in prison in Rome now. He's writing this letter to his son in the faith, Timothy, from prison in Rome. And he says, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. Now, one of the things I want to make note of, and I'll probably do this more than once in this study, is the fact, Paul, it's not about Paul taking this personally. No. Okay? But Paul is quite conscious of the fact that the words of Jesus, Jesus had said, whatsoever you do to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. Mm. He was maybe more aware of that than the average Joe, I the average so. Christian. Yeah. Why do you think? Because of his the commitment. Because, because of the commitment that he had to Jesus and the way he came to the Lord. 
That's he did, but that's not the reason I'm thinking of. The reason I'm thinking of was his very first that infamous encounter that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that he came to the Lord. The way he came to the Lord. Yes, which is what I I'm mean, saying. When Jesus said, Why are you persecuting me? Go on. You're doing okay. But no, but that's the that's the point if everybody heard you. The, the fact is that while Paul was going to persecute the church, he was headed to Damascus to persecute the Christians. He encountered Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who said to him, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? So Jesus saw him. It's not him persecuting the church, because Jesus, what you've done to the least of my brethren, you've done unto me. So you're not that, doing it to Paul. That would have been burned into his mind. I mean, that would have been burned into his spirit. The fact that these attacks, they're on the Lord. Yes. If you attack me, trust me. You're attacking the Lord. You, Jesus will take it personally. Mm. You'll have to deal with my big brother. You'll have to deal with my father. You start picking on me. Mm. <laughs> be prayerful about that. Now, but this is something we need to be conscious of. Okay? Because it is in our human nature. Mm. Let me emphasize the human nature. It is in our human nature. We want to be liked. Yes. That, that, that is natural, and that's the right word. That is natural for us to desire to be liked, to be accepted by people, right? Think about the account here. If you know the, and I pray that you do, you know the account of the man who had been born blind mm -hmm. that Jesus heals in John chapter 9. Right. And now if you don't know that, please make yourself a note. Go read that this week. Okay, and by the way, we have a study on uh, a study that I've done or a sermon I've done about that, and it's worth listening to. That yes, may be is. a biased opinion, but that's a truth. <laughs> because what happened was this man who had been born blind, and the, the apostles, as they're walking away from the temple, they're saying, You know, why they're asking Jesus, Why was this man born blind? Because of their theology at the time, they're saying, Was it because his parents sinned, or was it because he sinned? Because they believed in generational curses that came from the Word of God, from Scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. That got wiped away when, when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. So you get a new father. So he, and that, I promise you, that father has no sin to pass on to you, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens is, because all of a sudden, this man who had been begging at the temple, day after day after day, all of his life, I mean, he was born blind, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, people see him, and he's walking around. He can see. I mean, this is an amazing thing. It's a, it's a really an incredible testimony. But what happens is that upsets the Pharisees. That upsets the religious leaders because Jesus healed him, and he's proclaiming. He doesn't even really know who Jesus is at that point, but he is proclaiming that, that he was healed. So the Pharisees bring him into the temple and literally put him on trial. Questioning him. Questioning him. It's worth reading. And what happens is they call his parents in. And they say to his parents, is this, is this your son? Is he born blind? Was he born blind? So you know what happens? His parents back off. They said, ask him. He's of age. Because they were afraid of the religious leaders. Mm -hmm. They were afraid of being put out of the temple by standing up for Jesus. Right. The lesson there is... If you're going to be, if you are going to be prepared to stand for the Lord, you had better be prepared to stand alone. People will desert you. The only one that will stand with you is Jesus. Is Jesus Christ. Because he will never leave you nor forsake you. That's right. But it's, look at Jesus. What happened to people who were closest to him? The apostles. When he was put on trial. When he went to the, was going to the cross. Where were the disciples? I mean, all except the only one that it mentions that was there at the crucifixion was John. Where were the others? Scattered. Okay. So, even those closest to you, like the parents of that man born blind, may not stand with you. Just because you have counted the cost and are willing to pay the price does not mean that others will. Okay? Mm -hmm. Right. But you better have counted the cost and you better be willing to pay the price. If you're going to stand for the Lord, like I said, you need to be prepared to stand alone. 
and then you will find, as the blind man did, when Jesus, who came to seek and to find him, to save him, that which was lost, right, mm -hmm. found the blind man who would never have to walk alone again. That's right. <laughs> be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6. God will not leave you nor forsake you. That's what he said, right? It says that in, he, in Hebrews 13.5, it quotes that, that he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as I said, Jesus certainly experiences. In John chapter 6, and this is an important thing, Jesus was teaching, and I'll tell you what, his word can be hard. Yes. Hard as a rock. Mm -hmm. The word is a rock. That's right. It says when many of his disciples heard what he was teaching, or heard it, they said, it's a hard saying. Who can listen to it? John 6.60. And it says in John 6.66, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6. It says, and after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They thought that his word was too difficult. The word of God, that rock, can be hard, mm -hmm. but it'll never be too difficult because the Lord will give you the grace you need to deal with it, okay? You just have to have that desire and that obedience. As he even said, God said that he's searching the earth to and fro, and he will strongly support those whose hearts are to him. Amen. We are wholly committed to him. Yes. There, right? All right, let's zip right along. So now he's talking about all in Asia, and he specifically mentions two people. Yes. He's not afraid to name names. No, he's not. It seems like in this day and age, too often, especially the shepherds, are too afraid to name names. Mm -hmm. Touched not off the anointed. Is not only did he name names, but those na names that he did name are there in our Bible for all time. For all time, yes. For 2,000 years, so you're still naming the names. Yeah. Um, we A shepherd is supposed to guard the flock. Mm -hmm. That's part of his job. Yes. And part of that is to expose the wolves in sheep's clothing. Right. Now, you know, so well, don't be judgmental. You know what? You better go read 1 Corinthians 5 and understand that Paul wrote to them, to the Corinthians, and said, when I said to you not to judge, he said, he meant the people out in the world. Don't judge them. God's going to judge them. First Corinthians 5, go read it. I've got a question. Uh, what's discernment? And I'll answer that question. Uh, <laughs> kind of. D discernment to me is judgment in action. Well, the, the idea is, I mean, you can call it discernment. It, it's, you know, it says in Hebrews that the solid food of the word is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. We're supposed to be able to recognize good and evil, okay? We're supposed to be able to see. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, talking about these people who were out there, he said, you'll know them by their fruit. So the test is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You need to see that love of God in action in their lives. You need to see that joy in their lives. You need to see, I'm gonna tell you something. A lot of those people, there's no joy in their lives. They're miserable. They don't have peace. They don't have patience. Well, that's the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that discernment is given by the Holy Spirit. But that, the point is, we've been given criteria to use. And we're not judging for condemnation. We're judging for, and, and we're supposed to, well, read 1 Corinthians 5, for correction. Because our great desire and the purpose of a shepherd is to correct error. But you know what? That's of the sheep. You don't correct the error of the wolves. You bonk them on the head. Right. And you expose them. If they're, if they're wolves in sheep's clothing, you rip that sheep's clothing off. So they are exposed to for being what they are. All right? So, to save the flock. So now after talking about those two, he goes on in the next, I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. He says, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anessa Forrest. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me and earnestly, searched me earnestly and found me. He, he was a faithful servant. Yes. 
All right? But now you got a contrast. You have a contrast between the ones who were against Paul and the one who supported Paul. We're supposed to be faithful servants of God? Absolutely. But how about of the brethren? Yes. I mean, the teaching of Jesus is that we're to serve one another. We're to be faithful servants, right? Anessa Forrest was not a fair weather friend. When things went wrong in Paul's life, why well, I'm saying that they went wrong. When he was put on trial in Rome, when he was in jail in, in back in Israel in Caesarea Philippi, where I mean, a lot of times people are going to run away from him because they don't want to be associated with mm-hmm. that trial and tribulation and that trouble. Mm-hmm. Anessa Forrest was not a fair weather friend. My Bible says. I pray yours does too. In Proverbs 18, 24, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And as I mentioned before, Jesus said, and this is recorded in Hebrews 13, 5, he said that he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And then it says, talking about Anessa Force, he searched for me earnestly and found me. You know what? How often do we see, well, gee, where's that brother? Where's that sister? Where are they? Yeah. Maybe we need to search them out and find out what's going on in their life so we can be a blessing and encouragement to them, right? Mm-hmm. But Jesus, will Jesus be with you in trouble? Well, I'll tell you what. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Jesus Christ went through the fire, through the fiery furnace with them, didn't he? Yes, he did. He'll go. Because for the Son of Man, it is written, came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10. He loves you. He is that good shepherd. You know, he's the one that will come and look for the sheep that are straying. Thank God. So we are, it says, give honor to whom honor is due. Paul speaks in names and names of people that are being an enemy of the cross, an enemy of the word of God opposing the work of the Spirit in the church. But he also gives honor to somebody who is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that's before us, right? We need to do that. And it's not that we're trying to look for the accolades in our own life, but we should be pointing out that, you know, this brother's a good, faithful brother. And then, let's go to the next verse, because there's something important to see here. All right, so he, all of a sudden, in the midst of this, then Paul says, The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. He's writing to Timothy, who was the overseer at Ephesus. A pastor, the shepherd, the overseer is supposed to know well the condition of his flock. Timothy knew what Anastaphorus had done at Ephesus, all right? But it's like all of a sudden in the middle of this, Paul says the Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. What's that called? A prayer. It's called a prayer. That's a prayer interjected. Mm-hmm. I mean, Paul's talking about this, and you know, he mentions an force and he prays for him right then, right there. Right. That's what he's doing. How often do we pray one for another? How? Let me ask you a better question. How often are we supposed to pray one for another? All the time. All the time. Continually. Isn't that what it says? But it's like if, if somebody comes to your mind. Uh, in, in the context of Paul writing this, Anessa Forrest comes to his mind in contrast to the ones who abandon him, right? Mm-hmm. And, and by his pow, he, he prays for him. And the Lord, Lord, bless him, all right? I've always found that if somebody came to my mind, or, you know, if somebody that I, I hadn't been thinking about, and then all of a sudden they are on my mind, I just feel that that's the Holy Spirit saying, pray for them. And we should. We should be praying one for another. That's, And we should be praying without ceasing. That's the word of God. It's not my idea. And But this is a personal thing. This is like John in his, in his third letter writing. And he's writing a letter to Gaius. And he says, the elder, that's him, John, mm-hmm. to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Three John Chapter 1, it's only one chapter, mm. verses 1 and 2. Now, that verse is so abused in the church. Absolutely. I mean, that ju- that verse is used over and over and over. 
about God wants you rich. It's God used by the false prophets. It is used by the false prophets all the time. Let me tell you something. This is John praying specifically for Gaius. Paul just prayed for Onesiphorus because of his faithfulness. Right. John is praying for Gaius. Gaius because of his faithfulness. faithfulness. This man had a reputation throughout the church for supporting the brothers and sisters, for, for supporting the gospel and the work of the gospel as it went forth. He was faithful in that. If you're not faithful in that, don't don't think that God's going to have an, you know get some possibly praying for you right now. He won't. It's personal. It's very very personal, and it reveals what the attitude is to every like minded saint. Because this prayer is for gays, but it's also for every like minded saint. Everybody that has that same attitude, right? Right. You know, I talked about those two guys, they were not faithful servants, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a faithful servant. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 25. I want to read verses 28 and 29. Mm -hmm. He said, therefore, take away, you know the, the, the parable? He entrusts these servants right. as he's going away on a trip. A man yes. goes away. And then he says, therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has shall be more given, and he shall have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. God does not want everyone rich. He wanted to bless Onesiphorus and Gaius and all of them who are like them with a blessing. So that they'll have more. Because he knows that he can entrust them with more, because that more will flow through them. In 18, it says, on that day. What day is that? The day of the Lord. I'm, actually, I was going to mention that. I mean, that's, yeah. that, what day is it? It's talking about the day of the Lord, right? There's no place in Scripture where there is this overwhelming burden of God's desire for you to be rich with the things of the world. Absolutely not. I mean, well, I don't want to get too sidetracked, Mark, but it's like, you know, Think of the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Satan was one that came along and offered all of the riches of the world to Jesus. That was a prosperity message. Just bow down and worship Satan. So in verse, I'm going to go to chapter, second chapter, right? Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. When you see the word therefore, you got to understand that it's connected to what went prior, right? Mm -hmm. It's because of what was just said, this happens. Because. So, like Paul, you could wind up in prison. You could suffer. And everybody could leave you. Mm -hmm. Because if they hated Jesus, they'll hate you. Jesus said it in Matthew 10, 22. And you will be hated on by all on account of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. And he said, Paul, here in 2 Timothy, a little later on, he says, And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Therefore, I mean, you've got to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, right? Uh, that's a, that, by the way, that's scripture. That's not me, right? Yeah, that's that's a, Ephesians, a, Ephesians 6.10. That's what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. We're not to lean on our own understanding. That's what it says in Proverbs 3, 5. Mm -hmm. And we're also not to trust in our own strength. Mm -hmm. It's not about our strength. It says in Psalm 44, verses 6 and 7, For I will not trust in my bow, nor will my sword save me, but thou hast saved us from our adversaries, and thou hast put to shame those who hate us. You have trust in God. David that mighty man of God, a man after God's own heart, he wrote, some boast in chariots, some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 20, verse 7. That's where your strength lies, boasting in the Lord, praising the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord. You have to be prepared for what you will face because our strength is in his grace. 
Let me let me just read this before we run out of time. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians again. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 7 through 10. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ might dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You want to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might? Trust in his grace. Boast in the Lord. Don't look to your own strength. Don't boast in yourself. All right. Let me see if I can get the second verse in here. Chapter 2, verse 2. And these things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. It's, you know what it is? That's the Great Commission. Exactly. Yeah. The Great Commission is in Matthew 28 when Jesus, the end of Matthew 28, the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Right? Not a mentor. Not a life coach who suggests principles to people to have a more successful life, but making disciples, teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded to be pleasing to God. That's what discipling is about. The treasure, last week we talked about the treasure that Paul talks about here to Timothy. The treasure that is in you, God's love, God's word, it has to flow through you from person to person and from generation to to generation. Psalm 78 4 says this We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come to the, the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. In Psalm 145, verses 3 and 4, it says, Great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare their mighty acts. We need to be passing the word of God on. It needs to flow from us to the next generation, to people around us and to the next generation. We're not doing a great job at that. I'm telling you, and we're going to talk more about that when we gather again next week. Praise you, Jesus. So be with us. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you for your word, Lord, that is life to us. It is the eternal word. They are the eternal words of life. And you use them to mold us and shape us that we might be more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word, the word who made flesh, that rock that we stand on, firm and sound, Lord God. We just praise you and thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you and goodbye. Thank Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love.